All right, good morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, begin turning to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. For the month of January, we are taking a short break from 1 Corinthians just to kind of look at the church. Who we are as a church, what makes us healthy, what are the components of a church, what do we need to be doing as a church. And so over the next, uh, this week and the three weeks following through January, we're going to be looking at different aspects of the church. Well, today we're going to be looking at what makes a church healthy. Now, there is, it matters whether something is healthy or unhealthy, whether something is good or bad. It matters a lot. Especially this time of year, right? A lot of us have had the congestion, there's flu season, there's all those things. There's a big difference between being healthy and being sick, right? We can feel that and it it impacts our lives, it impacts our mood, it impacts our ability to work, to do things, to be nice to people. It can just, it can really just impact us. Even in the in the midst of the room of the realm of food. It matters whether it's the food is good or whether it's bad, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, right? Anybody ever pick up a cherry tomato and been so excited only to bite into it and it not be good? Anyone ever have that experience or something? I remember so I, in, through middle school and high school in the summers, I worked on a cabbage farm. And we would cut cabbage and things like that. When you'd go to cut a cabbage, you'd look at it first. If it looked rotten, you would skip it because you didn't cut the rotten cabbage and put it in there with a the good cabbage. Well, there was times though that you would go to a cabbage, you'd look at it, it looked beautiful. And you'd go to grab it and you would, your hand would go right through it. Because it looked beautiful on the outside, but on the inside it was completely rotten. And your hand would go right through it. And it would be nasty and it smelt bad. Even talking about ourselves individually, physically, emotionally, mentally, health is good. We want to be healthy in those areas. But even our world can't quite agree on that, right? You need to be vegan. No, you need to do the meat-only diet. Well, you need to exercise. Well, you need to jog. Well, no, you need to walk. No, you need to swim. No, you need to lift weights. And no, you need to do plyometrics. No, you need to do this. And we have all these ideas about what is healthy, what is not healthy, what is good, what is bad. And we see it all around us, right? We know the places to go eat. We know the places not to go eat. We know the foods we like, the foods we don't like. We can tell when something is not good, something is not healthy. But what about spiritually? How much time do we spend really looking at what is healthy spiritually and what is unhealthy spiritually? How much time do we spend looking at ourselves or even looking at the church that we're a part of? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? What are healthy habits? What are unhealthy habits? What are those things that are going to impact me? Is, there, is it kind of like the, the rest of the world when it comes to our physical health? There's all these different ideas. Who knows what's really the best for you? Or does God have a very specific plan that's clear and laid out? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look into Scripture. And we're going to look at what it means as a, not only individually, but as a church body. What it means to be healthy. So with that in mind, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to start with verses 1 through 3. This is God writing a letter to the church at Ephesus. So Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. And that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardship for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. That's the introduction to a letter written to the church of Ephesus. And it makes me wonder if if God today was writing a letter to our church, what would it say? What would he say? He's like, okay, write to the church of Winchester First Baptist Church. And how would he open? What does he say about the church of Ephesus here in this opening? That I know your works and that you labor and that you have endurance. That you you properly respond to evil people. You test 
things and, and speak truth. You've persevered. You endured hardships for me. And you've not grown weary in enduring those hardships. When we look at that, we think that is an amazing list. Wouldn't we all love to attend a church where people worked hard and labored hard and there was a never shortage of volunteers for anything? Wouldn't we love to attend a church that tested all things and held to the truth? Wouldn't we love to attend a church with fellow believers that endured hardship for the sake of God and remained faithful even in the midst of persecution and difficulties? See, by all practical, measurable things, it seems that the church of Ephesus is as healthy as one church can be. Look at all they're doing and all they've done and how they're working, how they're persevering. They have all these wonderful things going on. I can imagine if it was a church today, if it was a church of us today, we would say like, man, they, they, have got, they have got a wonderful children's ministry. They have got a wonderful youth ministry. They've got a wonderful music ministry. They've got food ministries. They've got outreach ministries. They have the rockin' VBS. They labor. Everyone's working. It's not that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. It's that everybody labors. Everybody's a part of the life of the church. Everybody is serving. That must be the healthiest church to ever health. That's got to be it. Look at all they're doing. Obviously, God is with them. See, is laboring? Is it doing all these ministries? Is it all doing all these things well? Is that a mark of a healthy church? Well, let's find out. Revelation 2, picking up verse 4 through 7. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do, not have, you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. While the church of Ephesus was doing all these wonderful things, working hard, laboring, enduring, properly responding to evil people, testing all things, holding the truth, persevering, enduring hardships, being persecuted, but not giving up on their faith, not growing weary, Rejoicing in their, in their hardships and in persecutions, everything. They had one massive glaring problem. They had abandoned their first love. Who is their first love? It is God himself. I want you to think about that great commandment that Jesus reminds us of in Matthew 22. Verse 30, 34 through 40, it says, When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command of the law is the greatest? Well, Jesus said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Loving God is the great marker of a healthy church. The church of Ephesus was doing all these wonderful, good things. Yet Jesus said, I'm going to remove the Holy Spirit from you and move on to a different people. And see, the problem is there's a lot of churches where the Holy Spirit is left. And they haven't noticed. Because it's all about the labor. It's all about the work. And it's all about having all these fantastic, wonderful, dynamic ministries. But it's not about loving God. A church that is not first and foremost seeking to love God, both as us individually, but also us together, is not actually being the church. At best... We are a social club. 
there are plenty of social clubs to be a part of. If you only want to do, if you just want to do good things, if you just want to do labor and that's just all you want to do and just loving God and committing your life to him and giving him all of your heart is just something that you don't want to be a part of, then there's plenty of social clubs that you can go be a part of that do a lot of good things in the world. But that's not what the church is to doing. And the sad part is, yes, a church can be laboring, enduring, persevering, serving, and still be extremely unhealthy. Abundant, growing ministries are not a sign of a healthy church. Now, a healthy church can have those things, but that's not what makes it healthy. It would be better for us to be a healthy church who's loving God with small, insignificant ministries than to be a church who isn't loving God and have dynamic, abundant ministries. And so that's where we have to come to, and that's the place we have to come to. So if we're not a collection of people individually who are seeking to love God first, then individually we need to repent. If we're not a church body that is focused first and foremost on loving and glorifying God, then as a church body we need to repent. See, we have primary reasons for gathering, and then we have secondary reasons for gathering. Our primary reason together is to worship God, to love Him, to enjoy Him, to magnify His name, to glorify Him. That's why we come. We don't come to have all our needs met. We don't come to be served. We don't come just to get. The church, when we gather as a body, we come to worship. But see, you can't come to worship unless you have been worshiping throughout the week. See, that's why a lot of people show up to church and they're like, music, doctrinally sound music can be sung, the word can be faithfully preached, and people walk away and be like, well, I just, I wasn't moved and that just didn't speak to me. If the word of God is not speaking to you, it's not the pastor. It's not the church, it's you. We come together because we've been worshiping individually all week. And now we're excited that we get together with fellow believers in Christ and worship God together. That's why we come and why we gather. That should be our primary reason in which we come. Is that we get to worship the Lord with fellow believers. Now, there are secondary reasons in which we can gather fellowship, eating together, children's ministry, youth ministries, food ministry. Those things are good, but those are not the primary. The church of Ephesus made those things the primary, and the loving God is the secondary. And God said, I will remove the Holy Spirit from your presence, and you will no longer be a church, and I'll move on to another people. That's how serious God is about him being primary in why we gather. This is not a little matter. This is not something that's up for debate. We gather first and foremost to love God, to worship Him, to magnify His name. That's why we gather. That's why we come here. That's what makes us a church. The church is a place of worship. But again, that our worship is only going to be as strong as the individual's who make up that corporate worship. Which means if you are not individually worshiping God throughout the week, when you come here on Sunday, you are hurting the body. We're going to get to that part in 1 Corinthians where it says, when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. As a believer, you're not living your life in some isolated cave somewhere where what you do doesn't impact the rest of the believers. It most certainly does. Who you are, how you act, what you do throughout the week will impact what happens here on Sunday. That's why individually and as a church, our primary 
goal, responsibility, aim, whatever we want to label it, is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we can do that whether we have six people, 60 people, or 600. We can do that with no children's ministry. We can do that with a massive children's ministry. We can do that with no youth ministry, no music. no, no. We, can, we can worship God without any of these extra things. So why do we allow all those little extra things to cause problems, to cause dissension, to cause issues? I know Marty probably remembers this because he was probably in the thick of it with the worship wars of the 90s and the big battles. Only hymns, only praise music, only hymns, only praise music. The battle was over preference, not the actual words being sung. You know how we know that? Because that repeats throughout history. Do you realize that um, the last church I served at, the music ministry, he pulled out these articles from the 1800s where people were throwing a fit because these new praise songs were overtaking the church. And these new praise songs were terrible, and they were ruining the hymns. The new praise songs were, Be Thou My Vision, It Is Well, Amazing Grace. They were like, these are rubbish, because they're not the hymns that we had growing up. Because again, it's not about the words, it's about style. We allow these secondary matters within the life of the church to ruin us as a church. The number of church splits over the years, over these secondary issues, is because they took the primary issue and set it aside and made the secondary issues the primary. But see, being a healthy church in God's eyes is much more valuable and important than being successful in the world's eyes. We can't spend all our time and effort Focused on the wrong things, or we're going to end up like the church of Ephesus. Where God is displeased to the point where he's like, it doesn't matter what you're laboring and doing, I'm moving on. This is why you have many churches today trying to manufacture experiences all the time. Because the Holy Spirit left the building a long time ago. And now they have to do all the work of reaching people. Of impacting people. Our goal shouldn't be to grow these extraordinary ministries. Our goal should be to worship an extraordinary God. And out of an overflow of that worship, do the things that he has called us to do. In the area of children, and of youth, and of music, and of outreach, and of inreach, and those things. But just like we sang Jesus is our chief cornerstone. If we're not building our church and building our lives on him first, we labor in vain. The church of Ephesus was laboring in vain because Jesus became the background to their story. The gathering of the church is not about your preferences or my preferences. It is about worshiping God. It is about glorifying Him and loving Him. That's how we determine whether we're a healthy church or an unhealthy church. How we individually and corporately gather to love God. That should be the driving force of all that we do. Why do we have a children's ministry? Because we want to teach children to love God. Who cares if they have a lot of fun if they never hear that and never learn that? Youth ministry, our goal is to teach teens to love God, to show them what it means to love God and how to love God. But if we just have all these fun and wonderful things and it's large and we have all these teens, but there's not that, then it was pointless and it was meaningless and it was evil. If we're doing food ministry just to feed people, but we're not primarily trying to love them and share the gospel with them, then it's pointless and it's meaningless. 
Because our primary purpose in all that we do is to love God. That's the mark of health. You know, if we wanted to take all these other worldly metrics, then we've arrived as a church. Ninety, I think it's 95% of all churches are under 100 in the United States. So we're top 5% of largest churches in the United States. That's pretty good, right? So obviously we're good, right? We've, we've, we've reached. We had, we're successful. We're healthy according to all those numbers. You know how many churches in our association, the Franklin County, Coffee County, Grundy County Association, how many churches do not have a children ministry at all because they have zero children? Half the churches. Half of the 43 churches. You know how many of them don't have youth ministries at all because they don't have a teenager? Over half. You know how many of them run under... We're the fifth largest church in all of Coffee in the Southern Baptist churches of all of Coffee County, Franklin County, Grundy County. We're one of like six churches that have multiple staff. We can look at all those things like we've arrived. Look at how amazing we are. But if we're not loving God, it doesn't matter. If we're not teaching people, modeling other, to other people, to the next generation, what it means to love God, we are not a healthy church. We have got to stop measuring health by the world's standards of success. See, when I go to the Tennessee Baptist Convention, or if I go to the Southern Baptist Convention, more times than not, if I'm talking to other pastors or hearing other pastors talk, what do they talk about? How many people do you run on Sunday, and how many people have you baptized? Well, we run two services, because we run 350. It's like, a, I'm like, and? You know there was an atheist church that started meeting and they ran like a couple thousand? Does that mean they're successful and they're a wonderful church? No. They're not even glorifying God. You know the satanic church can run several hundred people? Does that mean it's good? No. Looking at what God's standard is for the church... He cares that you are loving him. Even Jesus summed it all up. That's the whole of all the commands. That's the whole point of everything you do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's first and foremost. So if we want to be a healthy church, individually, that all needs to be our priority. Loving God with our lives. Denying selves, taking of our cross, and following after him. To be able to echo the words of Paul when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the body in which I live, I live for his glory. And then as a church, we come together. Our primary purpose of gathering here is to love God, to worship him, to enjoy him, to glorify his name. Not to complain about every little thing that didn't go my way. This it's not about you, and it's not about me. It is about him. And that's the attitude we need to bring when we gather. It's about him, not me. If we want to be a healthy church. So then the question becomes, okay, how do we, is there a way for us to measure if we're on the right track? If you would turn in your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're thinking, okay, <clears throat> we want to be a healthy, I want to be healthy individually. We want to be healthy as a church. How can we know if we're on the right track, if we're, if we're moving to health or if we're moving in, in an unhealthy way or an unhealthy manner? In Galatians chapter 5, I want us to start with verses 16 through 18. 
So Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So when it comes to being healthy, we're like, okay, we want to be healthy. How can we understand if we're being healthy or not? We need to first understand there is a difference between living in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. And we got to remind ourselves that our, our own sinful nature is battling against us. Our emotions, our thoughts, our passions, our heart, not always our friend. That's saying, just follow your heart. Don't do that. If you allow your heart to lead you and guide you, you're going to be deceived. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells, reminds us of that. The heart is more deceitful and wicked than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Because our heart, our thoughts, our feelings, our passions is deceitful, we need to have a reliable source of truth. Thus, God gave us the Holy Spirit. And we are to walk in the Spirit. We're not to walk in our own understanding. We're to walk by faith. It's not our logic, it's not our feeling, it's not our passions that lead and guide our steps. It is His Word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. There is a battle here. So if you want to be healthy spiritually, individually, and we want to be healthy as a church spiritually, we have to understand that there is an actual battle going on between our flesh and between the Spirit. Because if we don't at least acknowledge where the problem is, we're most certainly not going to be able to fix it. So I guess the first question is like, okay, well, how do we even walk in the Spirit to begin with? Well, in John 15, I encourage you to go and read that whole, whole chapter. But specifically in verses 1 through 11, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit, so they may produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. See, walking in the Spirit begins and ends with your personal relationship with God. That's why we're told in Scripture to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If you want to love God, you have to draw near to Him. You can't draw near to him if you never touch his word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Here Jesus says, if my word remains in you, you will remain in me. The reason a lot of individuals are unhealthy spiritually it's because God's word doesn't play a part in their daily life. The reason a lot of churches are unhealthy is because God's word doesn't play a central role in the life of the church. You know how many youth conferences I was, I was a youth minister for like 18 years. 
You know how many youth conferences I went to? And they had music, they had speakers, they had all these things, and we never once opened the Bible? You know how many youth groups I've been to and they, they, do, they do the whole thing and never once open the Bible? Or what they do is they do all these fun things and all these little fun activities and right at the end, okay, here's, here's a little bit from the Bible, amen, let's go. And we see that in churches, right? People come and like, oh no, just, just tell me how to have a better life. I don't want to spend too much time reading too many scriptures because that's boring. How many worship services are there that we see all these stories, we hear all these great things, and the Bible is just a side note in the background? I have been to churches. I have visited churches. Where the pastor opened up his Bible and then began to speak and never actually read it. And then hearing people come out, oh, that was a wonderful sermon today. Oh, that, was, that spoke to my heart. And I'm like, he literally never read the Word of God. That wasn't a sermon. That was a TED Talk. We have to understand there's this battle between what we want and what God wants. And if we want to walk in the Spirit, we have to draw near to God. There's no other way around it. There's not a shortcut. There's not a side trail. You have to draw near to God individually if we're going to be able to do that as a church. And you can't do that by setting your Bible off to the side and picking it up once a week to come to church. And even today, looking out, I mean, I can see a lot of things. There's many here today who their Bibles are not out. They don't have Bibles out, and they didn't even show up with a Bible. And then we wonder, why? Why do I feel so far from God? Why do I feel so distant? It's because you've taken his word. And you've taken this abiding in him and you've set it aside for other things. Not realizing there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. The works of the flesh, picking up in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul explains the works of the flesh are obvious. So beginning in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, Sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This list here was a warning to individual Christians and to the church as a whole. If we want to know if we're healthy or unhealthy, look at the list here. Strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, gossip, slander. If those things are a part of our church. We're walking, we're, we're walking according to the flesh, not the spirit. And that's a problem. When you gather with fellow believers, what's your conversation like? See, because Scripture tells us we're to speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts. We're supposed to be encouraging, building people up. But if you're gathering with fellow believers and you're complaining about people or about places or things, you're living according to the flesh. And there is something unhealthy, spiritually speaking, with your life and with your heart. Period. You're unhealthy. There's no way around it. There's no way to justify it. Well, I just felt like they didn't know. No, that's gossip. Doesn't matter. Strife, dissensions.
We're going to find out when we go to start to remodel the church, right? We're working with a company to get new exterior doors. How many of you are going to complain about the type of doors that get put up? (laughs) Think about it. At some point, we're going to need new carpet in here. How many of us are going to complain about the color of carpet? Well, they didn't get this color. I don't like that color. Why? That's not the primary reason in which we're covering. We're coming. If the doors don't have all the light around it like they do now, they're not falling apart and we got new doors, can we just not praise God that we can have new doors or new carpet? But see, dissensions, selfish ambitions, selfish ambitions come into the church all the time. Well, I want this ministry done my way. I want it to fit my schedule. I want it to be about me. I want this this way. Why can't you sing this way? Why can't you preach this way? Why can't you do Sunday school this way? Why can't you do this this way? Why can't we do this bit? When we bring all these things in, we're bringing in the flesh. And it's a sign that we're unhealthy. So what is the sign that we are healthy? Well, pick up Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Jesus in John 15 said, The Father is glorified when you produce much fruit. And then in Galatians, we're giving the list of what that fruit looks like. Love, individually as in a church, does that describe us? Are we loving, joyful? Unfortunately, a lot of Christians have a reputation of being some of the most honorary people there are. Peaceable. Do we seek peace? Patience. Are we patient with one another, understanding that, you know what? We're all different. We all have different struggles. We all have different personalities. So I can be patient with someone who's different than me, or maybe struggling in an area that I'm not struggling in, because I'm probably struggling in an area that they're not struggling in. Are we patient with one another? Are we kind? Would people describe you as just, when I'm around them, they are just a kind person. Good, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Think about all those things. If you're walking in the Spirit, those are the characteristics that describe you. And as a church, that should be our goal because we want to be healthy. We want to be glorifying the Lord in all that we do and all that we say. Meaning, if someone's coming to you to complain or to gossip, you stop it and you don't entertain it. And you tell them, brother or sister, We're to be loving, we're to be patient, we're to be encouraging. You need to go talk to that person, not to me. If we want to be healthy, we're actually going to have to live out what the Scripture tells us to live out. As it stands right now as a church, we are not facing physical persecution from our community. We're not meeting in secret or in hiding like many of our brothers and sisters around the world right now who are being beheaded, who are being burned, who are being tortured, who are being imprisoned, and they're just trying to meet as much as they can 
They don't care about carpet. They don't care about building. They don't care about chairs or pews. They don't care about music. All they care about is like we get to get together and worship the Lord. While we have brothers and sisters right now experiencing that, we are sitting here with so much freedom to openly worship the Lord. It would be embarrassing and it would be a shame if we allow little, trivial, first world problems to distract us from the privilege that we have together to worship the Lord. I want you to think about that for just a moment. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous that we may become the righteousness of God. God is holy. He is magnificent. He is glorious. He is beyond perfection. We have all sinned and fall short of his glory. Isaiah, one of the great prophets and great men of God in the Old Testament, when he came before the Lord, he fell down and says, Woe is me, I am undone. I am unclean. There is a massive chasm between us and God. We are not like him in any way, shape, or form. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is all-glorious. And we are undone. And our sin, the wages of our sin, because we've rebelled against a holy, glorious God, we deserve his wrath. See, the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're about to come to a moment with the Lord's Supper where we remember that Jesus came, he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. I want you to think about what he experienced in that moment. He was beaten. He was whipped. Now the whippings they would have done is they would have taken this whip and they would have interwoven glass and broken bones into it. And when it would have hit him, it would have wrapped around his body and stuck. And then they would have pulled it and it would have ripped his flesh open. Jesus did not endure that so that we can bicker about carpet and about doors and about styles and all these things. He did that so that we can come to the throne of grace with boldness. That we can be redeemed, that we can be forgiven, and we can have the opportunity to worship the Lord in truth and in spirit. We have been given a privilege that is beyond measure, beyond description, We can't be like the church of Ephesus who forgets that. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. That is first and primary. If we can't do that individually, we can't do that as a church, we might as well close our doors and let somebody else do it for us. Because guess what? If we're not doing that, God's going to close our church. You know what church you can't visit today? Church of Ephesus. Not there anymore. We don't just to give to be a church forever just because we want to. And we can't be a church where the Holy Spirit is left and we're manufacturing everything and we don't even notice because all we care about is laboring for things of the world. Or being successful in the world's eyes. And you can't do that individually. If you're laboring to be successful in this world. Rather than loving God. You are laboring in vain. Outside of Jesus. There is no health. There is no peace. There is no joy. There is no eternal love. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to the Father except through me. 
Jesus is the only way. There's not many roads, there's not many avenues, there's not many ways and many avenues for us to be healthy as a church or healthy individually or to be made right with God. There is one way, and that is Jesus, which is why we're told to fix our eyes upon Jesus. And so are we doing that individually, and are we doing that as a church? There's going to be a lot of opportunity this year for renovations, for ministries, for outreach, But we can't get so caught up in those things that we lose sight of the main thing. We cannot, under any circumstances, forsake our first love. We have to look to Jesus. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning in verse 17. Now in giving this destruction, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. In a part, I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you, so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. When you come together, then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this matter. Leading up to the Lord's Supper moment, and talking about remembering what Christ has done for us, Paul lets the church at First Corinth, of Corinth know you don't have the primary things right. You're not coming together for the right reasons. So it doesn't matter how many you, of you there are. It doesn't matter how successful you are. You're not coming for the right reasons. Why we come together matters. And why we come together is the gospel. Picking up in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and in this way let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. For if you were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. So we may not be condemned with the world. Why we gather, why we worship, it matters. The reason why you showed up today matters. If you're here just to be here, it's a problem. And that matters to God. God wants you here because you love Him and you're coming to worship Him with fellow believers who love Him. That's the whole point of the church gathering. 
is to love and worship the Lord. And it's out of that that should flow everything else we do. That everything else we do will not manufacture a love relationship with God. The loving God has to come first. Which means individually you can't get your life together before you first give it to Christ. You can't walk in the Spirit without first drawing near to Jesus. He has to be first individually and us as a church. When we come for the wrong reasons, we are disciplined. Church, our church's history The Lord has disciplined this church a lot. We have had church splits over non-doctrinal issues. Meaning selfish ambition, strife, gossip, slander, all those things were the driving force behind those things. When God is not primary... We're going to be disciplined for it. So our prayer as a church moving forward this year needs to be that we primarily, above all, individually and as a body, love God and walk in the Spirit. Producing the fruit of the Spirit. And we get the privilege of walking in the Spirit, glorifying the Lord because of what Christ has done for us. We cannot forget the gospel and why we're here. So some of our men and our deacons are going to come forward and we're going to, do, we're going to go to time where we do the Lord's Supper. But as they come forward, we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. Scripture tells us to examine ourselves. So ask yourself this morning, why am I here? Ask yourself, do I love the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Is glorifying Him the primary reason in which I gather with fellow believers? Also ask yourself, am I producing the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the flesh? Let us pray.